Hello, my name is Erica Carlson. I am a theoretical physicist at the Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute. Welcome to Quantum Connections, where we have interesting conversations with scientists and engineers working on all things quantum. And we're delighted to have with us today our guest, uh, Ricardo Cumin, who is a, a chaired professor of physics at uh, MIT. He did his uh, master's degree uh, at uh, Università degli Studi di Trieste in Italy. Close enough, maybe. Ricardo can, can, mm -hmm. can correct That's me later. Great. He did his great. PhD at um, University of British Columbia. And uh, he works on quantum materials, often using uh, X-ray sources and synchrotron sources. Uh, he's received many awards for his excellent research. Uh, just a few are the Bancroft Thesis Award in 2014, the Macmillan Award. He's a Sloan Fellow and uh, has received a, a Department of Energy Office of Science Early Career Research Program. Welcome, Ricardo, and, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So one of the things we like to ask people is, why are so many researchers uh, excited about all things quantum right now? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, in my, in my own view as, as you know, a physicist who um, uh, works on, on fundamental studies of these systems is really uh, my own perspective on this is that uh, there is a lot of interesting, interesting phenomena uh, that can be witnessed in these materials. Um, that uh, are just something that's very uncommon to our, you know, the, the reality of our interaction with the world as humans. If we think about technology, so beyond the realm of, of, of you know, pure and fundamental science, uh, I think what we're, what we're um, kind of witnessing now at this, at this time in history is, is like a second quantum revolution, which is kind of basically almost 100 years uh, trailing from what was the, the first quantum revolution at the beginning of the 1900s, which was the discovery and, and the realization that the, the behavior of, of the universe and the laws of nature were fundamentally different from what was thought before. And then this has kind of led the way to the developments of, of quantum mechanics back in those days. Uh, which provided the theoretical framework and underpinning for understanding the uh, the behavior of, of, of uh, nature and especially of matter at very very small scales like at the atomic scale and and now we're we're kind of we, the paradigm has shifted because now you know over the last century uh, there have been many uh, developments that have demonstrated that quantum mechanics doesn't just play out at the atomic scale but in some special systems, in some special materials, in particular in quantum materials, uh, quantum mechanical behavior is something that doesn't just pervade matter at, at the very small scales, but it happens also at the macroscopic scale. So we can have macroscopically sized objects, like millimeter scale objects, um, that, that behave as, a, as if they were a single quantum entity, like an atom. And, and, and now um, we're, we're kind of at a, at, a, at a moment in history where these kinds of properties of quantum matter can be harnessed uh, for, for technology and for science as well. And, and so the, um, um, the advent of quantum computing, quantum computation and quantum information technology is, is sort of, in, in my own view, is one of the most interesting uh, developments in this particular uh, field. And, and it's about really kind of trying to uh, um, trying trying to develop new, completely new uh, frameworks for computation that go beyond the, the, the limits of, of binary computation, which is based on, on you know classical bits, so zeros and one, and and moving beyond that and and kind of um, taking advantage of the ability to instead uh, control uh, the information in a quantum mechanical way, which, which creates uh, a, whole new, uh, uh, a whole new frontier of opportunities, in, uh, especially in the field of computation. So I think that if we think about the impact of quantum materials, that's probably one of the major ones at, at this time. Very exciting stuff. Um, so one of the things we like to also ask people is, what originally got you interested in doing science? Yes, so uh, that, that's an interesting question, um, and and it's been it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a winded uh, path for me, and and I, it, it's hard to trace back exactly when, when it happened, when it clicked. But I think, well, the, the first time I can remember of kind of a moment that was 
sort of like 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 um, a churning point for me was when I was in my early years of high school, and up to that point, I was interested in, in many many different things, uh, and and uh, not just science, but also beyond science. Uh, geography is like one of my you know big long standing passion. I'm, I'm a little bit of a geography junkie, but um, but then. I remember I was I think it was in the first few years of high school maybe grade the equivalent of grade eight uh, grade nine uh, in the American system and there was a problem a, a problem in geometry with math classes back in that day was a lot about geometry and there was a problem that I that you know I couldn't solve and then I went to my teacher and I asked her uh, you know how, how do you figure how do you solve this this particular question in this problem it was something that was in the book, but we didn't discuss. And so she was like, oh yeah, that we haven't covered. It's, you know, it's something that you can solve very easily with using analytic geometry. So I was like, okay, analytic geometry, that, that sounds interesting. I've never heard of that before. So I went to the library, the public library in my, in my hometown, and I got a book in analytic geometry. And I started reading this, I, I found it extremely fascinating. Um, like this world of, of math, which is very abstract, but also very, uh, logical. It's it's uh, you know it, it's it's like this beautiful construction uh, that that is you know com- completely com- com- comes out completely of the of the human mind without any uh, uh, the need for any external input. And so um, I started with that, and then I I have been reading um, uh, books on calculus, uh, rather advanced calculus books, like when you know when I was in grade. 10 or 11, and at that point I thought I would, well, basically I wanted to become a mathematician. Um, but then I had, uh, I always had an interest in looking inside of things, which actually is something that, that has, you know, uh, has, has continued and is still very much the case, even in the research that we do now in my, in my group. So, And I, I've always had an interest in understanding physical phenomena, but I, fo- I found the language of math extremely fascinating. And so I wanted something, a little bit of both worlds. So I wanted to be able to uh, observe uh, how nature behaves, like, you know, what's, what's, what's inside of something. How, and and, and when, when I looked inside of something, okay, then, then how does the inside of that work? Like, you know, kind of peering inside matter or, or you know, other, other systems, biological systems too, I, I, I thought they were particularly interesting. And um, so I had that that curiosity, that curiosity of, of looking inside things. But then I also had an interest in understanding these phenomena from you know you know using a mathematical language. And then so I got I got to the end of high school and, and I was kind of thinking what to do next. And the you know the, the discipline that kind of was the, was the best combination of both words ended up being physics. So that's how I decided to. Uh, you know, do a bachelor's in physics uh, in Italy, and then a master's, and then it was, you know, I, I, it was really it became a passion, um, and 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 then I decided for experimental science uh, towards the uh, the end of my master's degree, and then I moved on to a uh, to a PhD in uh, uh, in experimental science, and uh, well, a few years later, uh, here I am. Fantastic! Very interesting that you're interested in so many different things, and then actually. It was math that eventually got you back interested in in uh, physics and now into uh, into experimental physics. Uh, that's that's uh, fantastic to hear. So uh, we're also curious of all the great research going on in your lab right now. What's something you're re- particularly excited about right now? Yeah, so we <clears throat> we, we do many things in, in in my group, and you know some people say that many, you know maybe too many uh, in the sense that we're really. Uh, kind of all over the place, uh, studying many different materials, using many different experimental techniques. Um, but one of the one of the things that uh, we're doing now and that has stayed with me over the years, and it's something that uh, I always had a deep interest in, is to try and understand the the structure of matter all the way from the atomic scale to the micro scale and then the macro scale. So this is kind of looking at, looking at uh, materials uh, at different levels, at different scales, effectively. And, and um, this is something that is very challenging experimentally because going from the atomic scale where you're looking at uh, you know, the way atoms arrange inside a material uh, 
uh, all the way to understand how they form more complex, more sophisticated structures that achieve some function that you know the, the single atom wasn't capable of achieving on its own. Uh, it, it takes takes a big effort because there's a lot of information to retrieve. Like to, to you know going going from uh, understanding where the atoms are located to what are the new functionalities that large ensembles of these atoms can create in this class of materials, this quantum materials that we like to study, uh, is an, an extremely uh, fascinating topic. And it's a very important uh, scientific question in, in the realm of, of fundamental science because it tells us how we can go from fundamental properties of the building blocks of matter, so the atoms and the electrons, to this kind of emergent properties that, that, that a large ensemble of them uh, have. And so this is, uh, some people call this the multi-scale challenge, which means how do we connect the properties of matter at very different scales, like going from the atomic scale, where we are talking about a characteristic scale of the order of less than a nanometer, so a billionth of a meter or a, or a millionth of, of a millimeter, uh, all the way to the micron scale, which is a, a millionth of a meter, and beyond that too. And so in, in my group, we've, we've kind of, been working for many years on the development of, of microscopy techniques that um, can allow us to study matter all the way from the atomic scale to uh, uh, you know, a much larger scale where, where the, the composition of, of systems is like millions or billions of atoms. And, um, and so some of these techniques are, are very fascinating because they, um, they, they, they are a fundamentally different way to do microscopy. Uh, and they use X-rays, so they use uh, radiation uh, that have that has very very short wavelength. So, uh, by by its own very nature, it is capable of looking at very very short uh, scales, very very sh you know small dimensions. But at the same time, uh, if combined with with a class of methods that allow us to do computational imaging, so uh, in other words, we can use we can we can basically to imaging that's aided by computers. So we can collect information using x-rays and then fit that into some special algorithms that can tell us what is far beyond the, the natural scale that we can, um, um, we can probe in matter using, using x-rays. And so um, we, the, the state of the art for this research in our group is now being able to kind of collect um, uh, images or, 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 you know, yeah, collect, measure images, map out images of materials on scales that, that exceed like 10 microns and sometimes go, you know, even beyond that, like 100 microns. So we have these images that are 100 microns in size, but we can get information all the way down to 10 nanometers, which is like uh, uh, something of the order of four, four orders of magnitudes uh, of difference. So... And then the, the real problem becomes kind of information. Like there's so much information there that, that really how we understand the evolution of properties from one end to the other, it's really kind of an information uh, uh, technology problem, essentially. But anyway, so, so that, I think that's one of the most exciting developments um, in our group, the developments of new X-ray microscopy techniques that can really take us from the very, very small scale to the large scale and understand how the properties of matter kind of evolve from one to the other. Fantastic. So using big machines like synchrotrons, you shoot x-rays at materials, and uh, then you use a lot of math, actually, in order to help you interpret That's right. it. <laughs> so you've kind of you've come, come again full circle from the, uh, from the interest in, in math and in uh, the, the mathematics of geometry back to using it to understand quantum materials. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you, the audience, for joining us today as well on Quantum Connections. Thank you.